So I would like to, uh, so that we can associate with AURC, we can know who is here, uh, to know how, what the linkage between the work we are doing, Kipra and other researchers, in terms of how are we brought together. And we can't thank African Economic Research Consortium more uh, for putting us together, for enabling this very big research project to be undertaken for the last uh, three years. So allow me to invite um, uh, our colleague from uh, African Economic Research Consortium, uh, Diana, Dr. Diana Mushoi, to come and make her opening remarks on behalf of AERC and more so introduce us to the project. After that, we will have um, a brief by Kipro. I think I'm informed that um, the director is also traveled to Eldoret, so we will have one of the researchers from Kipro speak. And after that, we will have uh, the official opening by our dean. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, PK. When you hear me call him PK, we have come along with him. My name is Diana Mushai. I'm from the African Economic Research Consortium, currently overseeing the collaborative research. I'm a research at the Institute. Um, I'm here on behalf of AERC. And first and foremost, welcome. We are very glad to have this in-country dissemination workshop just to give us a brief of, um, for those of us who do not know much about ARC, we do graduate training, PhD, Masters, uh, of course in collaboration with universities, University of Nairobi being one of them, and we also do research, both thematic, which takes care of the early career researchers, you are here, you've just finished your PhD, Masters, that is your arm, it's, it's, it's on a rolling basis, and you have the collaborative which more or less uh, takes the mid-level and senior researchers. And that's where you find quite a number of researchers and the mid-level and a senior, and then they bring on board the young researchers so that they can work together. And we also have the communication and policy outreach arm, whereby the country uh, dissemination lies uh, under that arm. Just to give us a brief about the the objective of this project, uh, as uh, Paul has said, it has been funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And the objectives of this project are to generate evidence on the challenges of building human capital for accelerated inclusive development and to address key constraints on human capital accumulation such as weak public financial management and service delivery systems. I also want to take note of um, the research that has been taken in various countries. Basically, we have taken research in seven sub-Saharan countries, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, Burkina Faso, Senegal, and Madagascar. Kenya had two institutes, IDS and Kipra. So this is where we expect quite a number of papers to be presented, and each institute was doing two studies. So we, we, we demand more from this country, and we also have individual researchers, I think two of them. So in total, we should be having six papers. Those who are not, uh, are not presenting, we are going to find out why. So basically, we've also had some institutional capacity building, so we do capacity between the specific think tanks and other policy institutions through this project. So we, we are very glad to have come this far. Let me talk briefly about the necessity and importance of human capital for sub-Saharan Africa, which is where this particular project has been hinged, because all of us have looked at the World Bank Human Capital uh, index whereby we know that the sub-Saharan Africa is covering the lowest, which is about 0.4. And of course, we are not just talking about education. I know most of us associate ideas with education, but we're also looking at the totality of human capital. That's what we are talking about, the 1,000 you know, days, uh, early days. Then we have skills and help of people, which we know they are very crucial for development in African countries. 
and of course we play a, a pivotal role in the transformation of economies. We know that it is also very critical human capital for inclusive growth and shared prosperity in Africa. And as such, we are looking forward to facilitate regional and country-owned policy reforms. We are policy makers, we are here, we expect to have sort of homegrown policies in four key areas. Apparently, you find that probably the papers here could not cover the key areas in the old uh, human capital, but of course we are going to hear about the health, we are going to hear skills, we are, about to, we are going to hear about education. So the four key areas which we are looking towards country-owned policy reforms, the expanding government, investment in social services, introducing reforms and innovation to improve service delivery, committing to equity and inclusiveness, and addressing fertility and gender issues to harness a demographic dividend. So basically all this cut across all the aspects of our lives. And I want also to take note that we also need human capital development, of course, as we move towards economic recovery. We have done this project <laughs> for the last three years, that's why we are talking about impact of COVID-19, but I would expect all researchers here to be innovative enough to know that we are actually moving to uh, out of the impact, we are talking about economic recovery, so they expect more of uh, what do we do to move towards economic recovery? Because the impact, I think we have explored that quite much since 2020. So beyond impact. So that's what happens when we delay in research. So you must, you know, think and move very fast with the current events so that uh, the people have already done impacts. We are not saying we know this. We have already found this. Now what new are you bringing to our table as policy makers? as we move towards economic recovery. And also we need to talk uh, to take note that we have various sources of human capital formation. The critical factors influencing human capital development, which we expect to hear. Of course, we have talked about investment, or, or one of our colleagues will be talking about investment in early childhood development. Of course, including prenatal and early child nutrition and cognitive stimulation. So we are talking about investing in education. If we don't invest in the early childhood, you know, are we missing the link here? Why are we talking about investing in, in senior secondary university? What about the early, you know, years of development? So we also talk about equitable access to equality healthcare services, also being a source of human capital, equitable access to quality education, of course, including high quality basic education, higher education opportunities and on the job training and adult education is also another source of human capital formation. And we're also looking at well-targeted social protection programs to support human capital development, including, you know, uh, protection gains that have been made. So I've already talked about uh, the inclusive growth. Uh, basically, we know that it directly and indirectly positively in, I mean, influences, you know, economic growth. And those are some of the things you'd expect to hear. Then if it influences what, then what do we do about it? It also matters for employment outcomes. Human capital supports poverty reduction and boosts equity. And that's one I've already talked about. And it strengthens institutions. And of course, it's an accelerator of social cohesion and reduces the drivers of violence, conflict, and fragility. So the other question we'd ask ourselves is why now? Why are we talking about human capital now? Is it that, you know, it's something that has not been explored before. We know that increasing the share of youth in Sub-Saharan Africa is increasing pressure to grow the economy and create good jobs. And of course, this one also it's also ties to future of work. We are talking about technology is changing the world of work with serious implications for learning. So again, when you're talking about education, we want to hear in the future, what do we expect because of this technology that is not fast growing, 
to know uh, uh, the COVID really, you know, uh, so brought to open many, many things that we had not thought about before. So beyond that, where are we heading to? It goes so we could help avoid what you know I call the middle income trap and growing instead of economic and weather related shocks, emphasize the importance of protecting gains in human capital development. So uh, before I leave, I would just want to throw a few thoughts. And uh, one of the things you're talking about is investing and financing, you know, education, health. Uh, we know that uh, we have what we call limited fiscal space. How do we finance this? Where are we getting the funds from? We talk about multilateral multinationals, you know, devising innovative funding. What kind of funding are we looking at? This one is coming forth when we talk about policy recommendation. How best can we actively collaborate with government as consumers and promoters of human capital development? And how can we bring on board institutions to be key players in this particular area? How can we collaborate with them? So just to bring my opening remarks to conclusions, what we expect as ARC from this workshop, first and foremost, increased awareness and understanding of human capital development in Kenya. Also, we want to provide policy actors with a platform to discuss human capital development issues in the country. So we expect it is not ending here today. The discussion goes on. Our researchers will come for policy brief training. We would expect much on the Twitter handle today, any social media, so that the discussion is kept alive. Then to identify policy gaps and windows of opportunities, as well as to discuss strategies to accelerate Kenya's economic growth through addressing human capital development constraints. And we also expect strengthened co cooperation and networking. I've heard somebody talk about networking among the policy stakeholders on human capital and, of course, crystallization of areas for further research in the human capital field. I know we have not done it or we have not covered everything. Which are these further areas of research you want us to do and to venture on beyond what we have already presented today? Without further ado, I want to once again to thank the ideas and every other person who has been involved in, um, in organizing this workshop at ARC. We are very grateful and we continue to support you even going further towards the end of this project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Prof. Um, good morning once again. Good morning. My name is Violet and I'm from Kipra. I would love to speak a lot about human capital development, but Diana has done justice to that. So what I'll focus on is just uh, highlight uh, the role that Kipra plays, particularly in research public policy making process, and just ensuring that there is a connection between research and the public policy making process. So research is a government uh, institution uh, established by an act of parliament number 15 of 2006. And our role and mandate is to advise the government on public policy making process. So with that, we conduct a lot of policy research. We undertake a lot of analysis and uh, produce reports, policy briefs and publications across the different uh, economic uh, sectors that contribute to public policy. So you'll find that in this human capital development project, this is not the first time that KIPA is working with AERC and IDS. Um, in 2020, we undertook a study with AERC on youth unemployment particularly, which is uh, a key issue particularly in human capital development. And the report was published highlighting youth unemployment and sectors that have the potential to create employment for the youth. So we have a long working relationship uh, with the various players uh, in the house, in the room, and ARC and IBS have been uh, good partners in this process. And uh, so apart from public policy, we also engage in a lot of capacity building, and we do this by offering various commercialized uh, programs particularly um, in, uh, for executives and researchers. And uh, more to that is we are very keen on bridging the gap between university research 
and the government. So we have programs where we train our campus, uh, Kenya Kipra Mentorship Program, where we work with universities where and train or rather capacity build uh, young policy makers uh, within universities on the government processes, the public policy making process. And we do this on a regular basis. We have MOUs with various universities. The University of Nairobi is one of them, Kabarak University, MBO, and the like. So you'll find that at the end of the day, this also fits into human capital development through the life cycle approach. We want that as young um, people are going through university, they, are also, they also understand uh, research and how the government works. Um, much of that is currently we are taking a lot of research that relates to human capital development. And I'll highlight a few of them with UNICEF. We are very keen on child sensitive budgeting and planning, particularly uh, at the national level and county government. So we um, produce a lot of policy briefs and a lot of research around that area. Someone has mentioned the first 1,000 years are the most important years, they're the foundational years. And that is where we are very critical on how governments are budgeting and planning for these children under the age of five. Uh, and we do that through analyzing the budgeting and planning documents. We are also taking um, a lot of research in the area of health and nutrition, especially the status of nutrition in the country. This is a new area that we're exploring uh, this financial year 2023-2024. And we look forward to actually convening such a forum where we will be able to give policy recommendation on the status of nutrition and how that also fits into human capital development. Further to that is we have undertaken a couple of research, especially in CPC. Uh, so I know CPC is a contentious issue. I can see a lot of you are nodding and laughing about it. But we are also doing that. Uh, and all these fits into how our education system uh, fits into human capital development. Uh, what uh, I'd like to finish off with is that uh, we, in as much as we undertake a lot of this research, is that at the end of the day, this information has to be publicly available to you. It's not ours to use. So what we have done is we, with the support of government, especially the state department, we have a public policy repository. So all public policy documents, going all the way back to independence for national government and county governments, are on the repository. We are talking about policy briefs, we are talking about government circulars repository. And to finish off is that from this workshop, we expect that we will be able to identify the gaps in terms of the policies that we design and opportunities. Where are we failing? Where are we failing? So that as we move on, as we move forward, we are able to uh, tease out key policy recommendations that are implementable, whether in the short run or in the long run. I'd like to thank um, AERC for the support that they have given us, uh, Diana and team, and Professor Kamau, IDS, thank you so much, and it's a pleasure working with you. Asante Sana Karibu. Thank you. Um, the Chair, Department of Economics, Professor Oleche, the Deputy Director, um, IDS, Professor Paul Kamau, the manager of ARC, Dr. Mushai, the representative of the manager of Kipra, senior government researchers and senior professors from, and uh, professors and lecturers from my university and other universities. Um, it's an honor to be here in front of you to um, start the process of this workshop on uh, human capital. Human capital uh, comprising of education, skills, and health of people is considered as one of the most important factors of education development in, a, in any country. Among the generally agreed uh, casual factors responsible for the impressive performance of economies of most of the developed and newly industrializing countries is an impressive commitment to human capital formation, which is largely achieved through increased knowledge, skills, and capabilities acquired through education and training by all people in these countries. Um, 
as, as a person from humanities, I wanted to point out that there is also an aspect of human capital which are soft skills. These ones um, do not relate directly to the production of the hard results, but they uh, create a trustworthiness of, of, the, of, of, of the human capital. And I think that's an aspect maybe at some point should, could be considered uh, because the, they relate to the moral value of the individual, the ability not just to produce, but the ability to be trusted with what is being done or to be trusted with responsibility. So in that in philosophy, we would refer to it as not practical skills, but practical skills. So I'll continue then. Uh, human capital development is very important in, developing, in the development of any nation as embedded in the African Agenda 2063 and Vision 2030 in Kenya. For development to take place, uh, the human capital development in the form of education, skills, and training, social protection, and health must take a lead role, and more so for African economies, which are still lagging behind globally in these attributes. This workshop is focusing on disseminating research output and exchanging ideas with the major stakeholders drawn from government ministries, academia, education agencies, civil society organizations, private organizations, and practitioners in steering the discussion on human capital development in Kenya. The main objective is to foster linkages between research and policy, one of the weak links in policy development. The research findings being disseminated today are undertaken by the Institute of Development Studies, University of Nairobi, the Institute of, policy, of Public Policy Analysis, KIPRA, and individual researchers. The topics are quite varied, but they are all geared towards promoting the much-needed human capital development in Kenya. I congratulate the research team for incredible efforts and commitment in this important subject. The project is funded by Bill and Melinda Gates through the East African, through the African Economic Research Consortium, AERC. The overall objective of the project, as will be highlighted in the research papers to be presented, entails understanding dimensions of the current policy status and what is needed for future development of human capital even in a likely event of shocks like the COVID-19 pandemic. I thank the AERC for selecting IDS and KIPRA, premier research institution, to spearhead this important research. Although our focus today is on Kenya, I understand that the research project is being implemented in seven countries, seven African countries, namely Burkina Faso, Ethiopia, Kenya, Madagascar, Nigeria, Senegal, and Uganda. This creates a broad pool of comparative knowledge and experience across Africa, at national level, that work towards improving our HCD index, which is very low in Africa. The findings of this research will definitely shape the achievement of the HCD objectives in Kenya and other African countries. The University of Nairobi is committed to creating human capital through education, training, and research. Therefore, the findings of this research project are critical in informing the university in its mandate of provision of higher education. The discussion of the education funding is very important today, as it will shape access to higher education going forward. On behalf of the Vice Chancellor, University of Nairobi, I hereby officially open this stakeholders workshop and wish the participants successful deliberations. Uh, so we start with the first paper. It's on uh, the thinking education finance in Kenya for human capital development. This paper we are focusing specifically on uh, free primary education policy. Uh, so that we uh, see how the different formulas for financing education have impacted human capital in Kenya. Because of time, uh, starting production, 
<coughs> you already mentioned about uh, human capital. The elements that we focus on, not only education, but we have uh, health, we have knowledge skills, we have training, you have social protection. You will also noted that uh, for uh, development in a particular country, education is a key pillar through which we grow, develop um, human capabilities, we improve uh, skills that foster development. So it's not so much about the population that you have, but it's the skill sets that they have to drive the national agenda. And you're talking about economic development, political and social. So that's why even if we have uh, different actors who spearhead uh, human capital development, government is key. We have other actors that are there, including households, including other agencies, what they do. Uh, government is key, and therefore, uh, our focus for financing uh, education. How does that inform um, the capabilities of your general population? Um, then, uh, as we look at that, education in general is very pivotal to development, but um, of essence is basic education, because if you uh, lose out on basic education, it will be very difficult to collect that at higher education. And that's why our focus is on uh, uh, free primary education. Even when we look at um, the different levels of uh, development across the world, um, countries that have really invested in education or human capital development have been able to achieve accelerated development. Uh, then I mentioned that uh, in Africa we have the lowest human uh, capital at 0.4 and the need for the continent, for the country to really think and come up with a, a strategic policies that can really improve human capital development. Um, <coughs> when you look at uh, Africa in general, <coughs> sorry, when you see human capital is low. There are some constraints that we've been facing over time. Issues about uh, budget, financing, issues about political goodwill, that is the government of the day, and the uh, orientation towards education. Uh, you talk about education systems that we have, and uh, as you know, from independence, our education system has been mutating, and uh, the reason why this change over time, um, uh, how that affects our ability to develop capital is a question. Then there are issues about what is in the curriculum compared to the market demands, what we are teaching in our institutions uh, compared to our national and global uh, markets uh, needs that are there. Then awareness among the population sometimes is low on the importance of education and do you <coughs> know that uh, in some uh, instances you find people prioritizing other things not, not education um, then uh, we have a problem with enrollment to schools uh, that is sometimes low transition from one level to another is also a serious issue that we have and completion we post impressive figures when it comes to joining schools, but uh, completion is a bit uh, um, affected. And therefore, you find as a result of these constraints, that's why we are posting very low human capital index as a continent, as a country, and the need now to invest in that only think how we are financing our education. Um, when we look at our history and the financing of um, uh, education, it has uh, mutated over time, as we said, from Omito Commission of 1964. You run through all the way to uh, the recent presidential working party uh, this year. And we are looking at all these changes that we have introduced to our education system. The question is, why keep mutating? Why keep uh, changing? 
um, and you look at the weaknesses of every system that you've introduced and the need that comes to necessitate uh, that change that is there. You can look at, um, <coughs> for example, College Commission, 1999. And uh, it's about shifting from bid for four to uh, ticket, what we call total integrated quality education and training. Immediately after, you have uh, free primary education 2003, followed by CBC introduced in 2017. And then now we have this presidential working party that have introduced changes to the CBC. Is there something as policy makers we would have done to make sure that we have a consistent policy that is supportive of uh, uh, human capital development in the country? That's a main question. So when it comes to <coughs> what we were looking at, um, before uh, free primary education, in the year 2000, there were a lot of cities that were sweeping across the country from political change, moved away from Kano to Kibaki uh, presidency, introduction of uh, Millennium Development Goals around the same time, with some aspect focusing on education, uh, universal primary education, issues to do with CDF, issue 2030, and there are so many things that were happening during that period. And then, uh, when FPE was introduced in 2003, uh, what we noted is that there were issues that came with that, some positive, other negative. Positive, we had um, increased access to education, enrollment also went up, and this is the classic example where you have even have uh, Kimani Maruti at the age of 84 joining class one and so many other cases that were there. Uh, so there was uh, issues that were there. Household levels that were struggling with taking their, their kids to school. Uh, there were some reliefs that were there. But on the downside, um, we didn't have infrastructure to accommodate these new numbers that were there. So there is congestion. Uh, we didn't have enough teachers. And uh, the number of students have gone up, but the number of teachers were not there. Then the allocation of resources uh, from other budgetary uh, allocations, issues to do with uniform and meal costs that were there. So there were issues that were there with the introduction of the uh, uh, FDA. <coughs> So the issue that we are looking at, what is the impact of FPE to human capital development? We're using the proxies that define human capital development. Then we found that um, we have a lot of literature about uh, human capital development, but um, when it comes to FPE, uh, we don't have a lot documented, especially for the impact that was there to guide further policies that were there. Uh, the approach that we used to conduct this study, uh, we used time series data of about uh, 30 years from 1989 to 2019. That's World Bank data. That was the primary um, <coughs> data that we were using. We combined that with um, a series of uh, workshops where we were getting um, input from uh, key informants, starting with the first one that uh, we did early last year. Uh, we have done several workshops in Nairobi, I think about four. This work has been presented in Uganda, in Madagascar, and in Dakar, Senegal. So with uh, key informants, with um, uh, reviewers that are there, this has really shaped the work that we have uh, uh, done. So it's quite extensive. And you can guess with all those the people have gone through metamorphosis until now we got here. So the key findings, you can go to that. <coughs> the first one is that there were significant and positive relationships between free primary education and education outcomes in Kenya. And uh, these are issues that I've talked about 
when it comes to enrollment, when it comes to transition, when it comes to completion dates, it went up. So that was positive side of it and uh, came as a result of uh, introduction of that. Then uh, there were issues with staffing where you find that um, teacher pupil ratio uh, significantly rose and in some regions like uh, in former settlements you find one teacher serving the highest record was 97 students especially when you talk about informal settlements when you go to other regions uh, so that's an issue that uh, should be taken into consideration when it comes to uh, any significant shift in terms of policy then as the project was uh, as the program was being implemented uh, there were cases of dropout that were registered and uh, that is because you find the people who joined who are outside the age of uh, joining school uh, some got disinterested some could not cope because you can imagine an 84 year old man in the same class with a 7 year old or you are 15 still present so there were significant uh, uh, jobs that were there people could not cope to the system and uh, the main reason being as the policy was crafted very few people thought of the outliers who are going to join and how you take care of their interest, how you make sure that they can be able to cope. Then there was an issue about budgetary allocation, which is key when it comes to human capital development. As a country, how do you balance between a, uh, a priority issue and other um, budgetary allocation uh, sectors that we need to do that? Then, uh, there was an issue about implementation, which was quite a challenge, um, and the inconsistency between political goodwill and uh, um, advice from technocrats uh, on the same. But in this particular one, it was about uh, political uh, um, interest taking uh, effect, even without a proper uh, implementation of a proper um, policies being in place that is well thought out that uh, could even anticipate the issues that would come with that and address them uh, in time. If that we come to the conclusions that we could make, that MPU was um, in a way success, that there were issues with it that were not well thought out. Then when it comes to issues with change of performance, uh, it was marginal and uh, this can be explained by other actors other than the government who are there. We have donors who are supporting the programs and uh, of course that led to some change in terms of uh, performance. Then issues to do with gender and regional inequalities when it comes to implementation of the same because you find some regions as Others are posting very good numbers in terms of enrollment, others there was no significant change that was there. Then the issue of the girl child, then 2003, you find that there are more boys who were able to enroll than the girls that are there. So these are issues that are um, were there with the, with the project. Then <coughs> issue of uh, quality education. When uh, you have uh, 97 students per one teacher, when uh, there is overcrowding. So these are issues that were there. You find that, uh, yes, the numbers are very impressive, but what about the quality of education that they're getting? Uh, that's another issue. Then um, there were some costs that were, of course, to be met by the households that were not brought out. Yes, you can provide free education, but what is happening in the households? Are they able to feed? the children, are they able to provide things like uniform? So those inequalities were, were still persistent uh, in the households. Then um, the issue of political advancement, this was a presidential campaign issue um, that uh, never went through a proper consolidating processes. 
and uh, some of the challenges that emanated from the program, you can point out um, lack of uh, 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 proper consultation with uh, experts who would have guided better in terms of implementation of the of the of the projects. And that's a question. Even other policies that we have, where the experts, where the researchers, where are the doctor guys who can create the process? Are they consulted? Are they used, taken into consideration? Policy recommendations are very quickly for the grid. Uh, it's a good program, have posted some uh, successes, so it should continue to be uh, supported. Then from there, because it is basic, how can that be extended to now secondary schools and higher levels of education so that uh, you don't train basic people who cannot be able to transition to the next level. Uh, issues about training teachers, especially in service, to be able to deal with uh, uh, emerging uh, issues. So if you say saying uh, in teacher training, I don't know whether there is any quality that had thought that you can be teaching someone who is much older. How do you deal with them? Uh, people who are 20 in the same class with the uh, uh, year 7 or something like that. So these emerging issues and how you train teachers to be able to handle that. Then uh, consideration of regional gender variations should also be addressed. Uh, there is a question that has been raised here severely about uh, physically challenged, uh, how policies provide for that. Then integration, as you come up with a policy, how do you make sure as much as you support children in school, they are supported at household level for consistency so that they can be able to uh, keep in school <coughs> and be able to benefit from that. So both the uh, uh, school life and also at the household. Then the need for consultation, that cannot be ignored. Even where there is political goodwill, how do you uh, strengthen that with uh, expert advice who can help to uh, crystallize the policy so that it's a success. Last three, it's about education systems, reforms that should be arrived to the country's needs. What does the country need? Are we training for our own market? Are we training for other markets? That is, whose interest does our education serve? Does it serve us as a country or whose interest is it, is it uh, taking? Thank you very much. That's the end of the first presentation. Yeah. My capital development and particularly um, the morning session with Diana and Sam emphasizing on the significance of human capital development, particularly education, health, and skills training in um, social, uh, economic, and political development. And so uh, human capital accumulation or development is a life cycle uh, approach from uh, the foundational years going all the way into adulthood, into the labor market, and so on and so forth. And so, um, uh, accumulation uh, also is related to enrollment attendance and completion, 100% uh, enrollment attendance and completion. So just a quick overview of social assistance programs. These are programs uh, that form uh, the large part of social protection programs. Sometimes we refer to social assistance programs as social safety nets. So the social assistance programs are non-contributory. Um, the beneficiaries are not required to contribute and they are implemented in either you're given uh, through cash transfers. Uh, a good example is the CBT OVC for orphan and vulnerable children where they're given cash transfers and the elderly. We have fee waivers, we have in kind, um, and sometimes we have now school feeding programs as a form of social assistance. And they can be conditional or unconditional. So when they are conditional, is their conditions attached to the kind of social assistance that you are receiving. And these social assistance are mostly targeted towards the poor and the most vulnerable in the society. So what happens is you'll find in a situation where there is a shock in the economy, a good example is the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic. 
a lot of us had to cut down our expenditures within the household. Um, perhaps it could have been rent, but you'll find when there are shops within the households, what happens is most households will cut down expenditure and particularly expenditure on schools. School takes one of the largest expenditure within the household. And once that expenditure is cut, be it uh, school fees, be it um, uniform, textbooks and all that, it affects, uh, leads to low enrollment uh, within the household. Um, also, what I want to highlight is uh, what happens when economies invest in social assistance. So, globally, this data is from the Aspire. The Aspire website is a World Bank website. It's an um, Atlas Map for Social Protection Indicators. So, what happens is Aspire estimates uh, the effect of social protection or social assistance on poverty reduction. And you can see that uh, in countries uh, such as um, upper middle income countries, the poverty reduction is high when social assistance programs are implemented. When you compare that to low income countries, you can look at the, the, the blues and the a bit of the yellows, they are on the far left. So that means that there's very little uh, contribution of social assistance to poverty reduction. So what is the question there? Is it that the low income countries are not investing as much in social assistance programs? Is it that the implementation of strategies are not as effective as we expect them to yield the same results as the upper uh, income countries? I mean, food for thought. We have the designers and policy makers in here. So school feeding programs, um, as I have mentioned, is one of the most popular social assistance program, and it's been implemented across 80 countries uh, as of 2018. And uh, you'll find that uh, in low-income countries, uh, a lot of the social assistance, and particularly school feeding programs, are financed by the donor community. There's very little contribution from our exchequer into school feeding programs. So the donor community, the humanitarian community, are the largest contributors of social assistance programs. And they're very critical in human capital development in that they won first in food insecure areas. They motivate parents to enroll their children in schools. Uh, you'll find that so chronically hungry children uh, get the motivation to attend class and go to school. Uh, as long as food is being provided in, in schools. And two is that they provide nutritional requirements that are critical for cognitive development, particularly in the past 1,000 days of um, a child's life. So you'll find that a lot of these school feeding programs not only uh, encourage enrollment, but offer nutritional benefits. So looking at that graph also from the Aspire, You'll find that uh, uh, I'm more interested in the school feeding one. Uh, you'll find that very uh, the proportion of spending on school feeding is very low uh, across most of the economy. Uh, but particularly, what, what is interesting is in sub Sahara Africa, it's relatively high, and Latin America, and these are low income countries. This is where the most vulnerable and marginalized live. So if there are um, a bit of expenditure in these uh, uh, low-income countries, why is it that the poverty reduction, you remember the previous graph, the poverty, poverty reduction effects are still low. So what is the issue? That's, we'll keep that question at the back of our minds. So just coming close to uh, close home, uh, is all of us, uh, or rather the previous speakers mentioned, education is quite important. And uh, it contributes at the global level, the SDGs, the um, uh, Africa we want, uh, the 2063, and as well as the Vision 2030. Uh, and in the Constitution, it's anchored within the Bill of Rights that um, every child has a right to basic, free, and compulsory education, as well as the Basic Education Act of 2013. So in uh, an effort to try and make sure that we achieve free and basic compulsory education, the government has consistently invested a lot of resources. So previously, um, the education budget used to take about 25% of the total budget. Last year, it increased to 27 percent. 628 billion went into the education uh, sector. So, 
you can see that there's a lot of efforts, including policy initiatives and reforms. Um, some has talked about FPE, we are talking about the free day secondary education, we are talking about the evolution of ECD uh, as well as a hundred transition. So all these initiatives are geared towards ensuring that learners have access to to basic education. And we have seen improvement um, over the years. But despite these significant improvements, we also observe disparities and low net enrollment rates, particularly gender, which I'm not going to talk about here, but also region. So looking at the, um, uh, the primary, which is the default function, as of 2018, about 22% of learners, 23% of learners in pre-primary, between the age of 4 and 5 years, were not in school. They were not enrolled. And a lot of these learners were in the Asal counties. We are talking about Mandera. We are talking about the recent world. So for instance, in Mandera, um, only 18% of four to five year olds went to school in 2018. Uh, so using the latest statistical budget from the education, uh, Ministry of Education 2020, it was published the other day. The NER, primary NER was 78, 79%. So about 20% of our children uh, between six and seven years old are not in school, as well as in secondary. Now in secondary is where we also have uh, some concerns, uh, it's around 46% of learners are not in school. These disparities are even wider when you look at uh, at the county level. So consistently, this is pre primary and secondary. Wajia, Garissa, Marsabi, Taranda, the other counties have low enrollment rates uh, which, uh, of course, access, affect access to education and um, human capital development. So, I'm just trying to paint the picture. Poverty comes in. So, this is the correlation between poverty and access to education. You can see counties on my far right. High poverty levels, low, and ER rates. So, um, all these are the factors that affect access to education in Kenya. So how does the uh, school feeding program come in? Uh, for a very long time, school feeding programs uh, have been implemented by the World Food Program. And they all the way from the early 80s to around 2009, it was being implemented by WFP uh, in, in collaboration with the ministry. But then again now, WFP felt like it's about time to hand over this program to to the government. So gradually they started handing over the program to the government. And then now officially in 2018, um, the government was in charge of the homegrown school meals program with about a million beneficiaries. Even though it has a million beneficiaries, this program is particularly uh, targeting the ASAL and informal urban settlements. So of course there are minimum exclusion errors whereby there are counties that are poor, they are neither in ASAL or in formal urban centers, and they are not benefiting. So what do we do about that? And uh, uh, provision of school meals has a framework in place, which is the National School Meals Education and Strategy. Uh, it provides a policy framework to ensure that um, there is access to school meals. And also when designing school meals in schools at the national and subnational level, it provides a framework for that. Uh, there are a lot of literature that link school meals, school distance to school, which also affects um, access to education, poverty, also says gender of the learner and the like. But uh, the presentation puts a lot of emphasis on school feeding programs. So what are the key takeaway messages from this uh, paper? At the pre-primary level, because this analysis was done at three levels, the three levels of basic education, pre-primary, primary, and secondary. So at pre-primary, yes, we found there were insignificant results. But that does not um, negate the fact that provision of school meals at the ECD level is quite important, particularly for reasons that I had mentioned before encouraging learners to go to school and providing nutrition to learners. 
between uh, under five years. But also it could have been insignificant because uh, you find that ECD is a function of the county governments. And most county governments are not, rather, do not have a budget line for school feeding programs. So that could explain this insignificance. And what do we want to do about it? Well, that's a discussion that should take place in this room. And then in the overall population, we also find discrepancies between private schools and public schools. Now, in private schools, the school feeding programs have increased enrollment. So if a private school has a school feeding program, all that means is a lot, it's going to attract a lot of learners. But in public primary schools, as if a school has a school feeding program, interestingly, it reduces um, enrollment by 1%. And I kept on asking myself, I mean, it's supposed to attract learners. But on further literature review and looking at various reports, uh, we find that one, implementation of school meals in public primary schools is a function of the national government. So what you find is, when government, national government is budgeting for school meals, let's say in Kibra primary school, they do not factor in that Kibra primary school has an ECD center. And this is the responsibility still of the head teachers there. So you find head teachers try to accommodate these young children, if especially the county government is not giving them meals, and they start rationing these meals. So all the children will get less to make sure they accommodate these ECD centers. And two, uh, there's a lot of challenges in terms of late disbursement uh, of these, uh, sometimes they provide supplies, so they come in late. A week later, kids have not had uh, school meals. And thirdly, what happens is MOE is a, a, aggregates um, these supplies in one area, and schools have to go to the, maybe the county director for education to pick the supplies there in some cases. So what that means, it increases the cost. We are talking about the logistics. Moving from your school to go pick the food from uh, where it is and come back to school. There's firewood which is not factored in. So those are, those are the reasons that could explain why parents would choose especially not to enroll their learners there. And then in um, Asal counties, uh, because uh, there was a regression where I did an Asal subsample to be able to assess these uh, effects, especially on, on asset counties. Uh, in primary and pre-primary, it increases enrollment. But uh, this could also be explained by the fact that still, even though WFP and other organizations uh, handed over the official school meals program to the uh, government, you find that they still implement school meals with schools within these counties, especially during the drought that we experienced in 2019, 2020, 2021, these organizations are still providing school meals. So what that means is they have systems that ensure consistently this food in these schools, regardless of the situation, from logistics to uh, supply chain monitoring uh, systems <coughs> that ensure that they do not run out of stock. So this uh, could also explain that <coughs> significance. What is the takeaway message from her? Is that one, we need to ensure this. In as much as we are advocating for the school feeding programs, we need to ensure efficient implementation. As we are designing these school, uh, school feeding programs, how do we envision them being implemented? So the late disbursements, the logistical issues, the supply issues, how do we navigate those challenges? And uh, it's important to take that into account. And two is, as we target um, these uh, programs, the asal counties and uh, informal urban settlements are critical, but there are counties that also are deserving of these uh, school meals programs. One of them is Busia. Busia has one of the highest poverty rates in the country, top five in the country, 66 point something percent. But still, it doesn't receive uh, the school meals because neither in Asal or urban informal settlement. So we also need to rethink that. And finally, this is for the county governments. I know Yuri is in the house, they might give us their experience. As we budget and plan, 
let's ensure that ECD centers in our budget documents, in our planning documents, are put into consideration. As a devolved function, it's important to be able to take up that role and that mandate and ensure that uh, you provide and take care of these ECD centers within your counties. Finally, uh, I'd like to uh, give a few uh, limitations of the study and areas for further research. One is that the data that was used was not at school level. If we can get data at school level, this was household level, where the dependent variable is, is the school that the learner is attending, uh, does it provide a school feeding program? So if we can get it at school level, then that would give a better picture, particularly if one is uh, willing to undertake an impact assessment. That would be very critical. And then two is the quality of school feeding programs, and this is from literature, is quite is very important. Uh, we need to know what kind of meals are these kids being provided for on, on a daily? How is it contributing nutritionally to their cognitive development? It's very important. So if someone has access to this kind of data, they can go ahead and undertake further research on the quality of school feeding programs on human capital development. Allow me to stop there and thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to present on uh, this specific topic as we look into the non-cognitive and cognitive skills and their joint effect on uh, labor market outcomes. So this evidence is uh, based on youths aged 15 to 25 years. So I will just start with the context and then we look at the trends in Tibet because the data we used uh, in this study was uh, mostly based on Tibet. Then uh, I will move on to the key problems, the data, the key findings, then the key uh, policy recommendations. So to just start off uh, with the introduction, uh, you probably want to ask yourself what are cognitive skills. So uh, these are brain based skills uh, that support specific neural works. So this is what we are mostly taught in schools, your mathematics, how fast you think, um, and, and this can be based or rather measured through numeracy, so numeracy tests, literacy. Then we have the soft skills, what are they? So these are mostly um, patterns of thoughts, uh, feelings, behaviors that comprise personal traits, attitudes and motivation. So this could be linked to what Professor Nyandero mentioned, uh, values, mostly values. Then uh, employees who can adapt uh, to changes in technology are usually the ones who have a combination of these two skills. So they are able to fit well in a dynamic uh, contemporary workplaces as they are right now. Um, then when you look at um, the, the, the previous studies that have been uh, undertaken by previous researchers, they've mostly focused on the cognitive dimension of education and um, this has overlooked the reality that both dimensions are critical, just not for academic performance, also in the labor market. So uh, to put this into context, um, the government of Kenya has launched uh, numerous reforms and initiatives to help the youth catapult themselves uh, towards um, welfare, or rather them improving their welfare, uh, their contribution to social and economic development. But then uh, there, there are some challenges. So when you look at the, the education scene, there's been some expansion. And that is uh, what I'm presenting right now. So in, for instance, focusing on the TVETs, you can see that the expenditures uh, have been increasing over the years since devolution. Uh, till present, and what has been expanded so far is 55.4 billion in equipping and just revamping the Tibet Institute in form of uh, infrastructure. Then, when you look at the number of Tibetan institutions, you can see they're also increasing, 
and uh, the total number of Tibet institutions have grown all the way to 2,396 in 2021 from 753 in 2013. So this is a good improvement and of course with this um, trend you expect that uh, youth unemployment will decrease. However, uh, there is a key noteworthy challenge that you face, face, that is the limited information on what uh, skills are quite necessary for employment. And there's also limited collaboration between the training and what is actually required in the labor market. So there is that mismatch um, given the curriculum that the Tibetans have. Looking at the enrollment, you can see that is also increasing. So here we can see enrollment by males and females. Um, of course, the males are, are, are highly enrolled, but for both genders, uh, it's, the trend is increasing. So um, that is um, on, the, on the trends. When you look at the ongoing reforms, we currently have the Kenya Vision 2030, that emphasizes the need for education systems that foster creativity, innovation, and critical thinking, while also developing the soft skills, what, we, what are the uh, personality traits, or what we call the non-cognitive skills. We also have CBC, a new education system introduced in 2017, that's also looking into, into this. We have the technical and vocational education and training uh, that have prioritized equipping the learners on both the cognitive dimensions and the non-cognitive as well. We have KEOP, the Kenya Youth Employment and Opportunities Project, which is a government-led initiative aimed at improving the employability of young people in Kenya. To add on to this, the government of Kenya has collaborated with, with the industry, the labor industry, to develop the Kenya Labor Market Information Systems. When you log into that specific site, you will find that uh, the idea was to signal to the training institutions on what specific uh, skills are required in the labor market. But when you look at that, um, the data that's on that portal, it's mostly emphasizing on the cognitive skills that are required in the labor market, and they've relegated the non-cognitive domains, which are equally needed in the labor market. So this leads to our key problem. Uh, of course, students are not the only uh, education uh, subsector that has contributed to youth unemployment, but it is one of the areas and you can see youth unemployment over the same period of time when you compare with the trends in the TV, or, or, or rather in terms of investment in the Tibet area, you can see that youth unemployment is also increasing. And this sparks a great concern in the job market. So this mismatch uh, can be attributed to the insufficient emphasis of the combination of these two skills, the cognitive and the non-cognitive skills. So why are these issues uh, really important? In both the education and the workplace settings, the cognitive factors are more important predictors of success uh, than the cognitive factors. And those uh, individuals who have both have a probability of higher employment or wage premiums or returns yeah. as compared to those who have none of these two or just one. So in today's uh, environment, given how fast-paced, we, we, we are moving into an area where the job market is um, it's aligning itself to how the global labor market is, is moving. Um, there is need for a combination of these two skills to enable the Kenyan uh, youths be uh, rather to give them an edge to compete in these same uh, job markets. 
So to tackle the issue of acute youth unemployment and give them uh, this competitive age, edge, it is important that, for instance, the curriculum be tailored to these specific demands. So our study looked at uh, this specific data. We worked with this data from Ujana 360 Zizi Africa Foundation, which was a program being undertaken by the Dalberg Institution. We used national cross-sectional survey data set and uh, we were able to at least analyze 2,361 youths from all 47 counties in Kenya. And we looked at the demographics, the respondents' awareness and their perceptions towards t the the respondents' employment status and perceptions on the prevailing economic scenario, we looked at their youth capabilities, values, and skills. We looked at the work and life outcomes and factors influencing them. And finally, the human-centered design uh, study assessing the capabilities of the youth in literature and numeracy. So we were asking our main uh, question, uh, what, what do you really want to look at? And we wanted to address two things. So our analysis looked at the gender aspect uh, to, to, to try and address the gender disparity in this scene. And we also looked at where there is a mismatch. We are trying to answer where is there a mismatch between the skills being uh, incorporated into our students or youths um, in the training institutions. And once they get out of um, the trainings, they are not able to you know, grab the opportunities out here. So we are looking at how complementary these two skills are, how they blend in, and how that joint effect is on the probability of the youth being employed. So to just jump into the key findings, we found that uh, a good percentage, 51% of the employed were male, while 24% of the employed were female, and in regards to the education, 52% uh, of the males and 51% of the females uh, had secondary education, while both 37% of males and 37% of females uh, respectively had primary, pre sorry, primary level education, according to the sample that we worked with. Also, when you look at uh, the marital status, on average majority, that is 68% of the respondents are single, and uh, this can also be attributed to the age we are looking at, 15 to 25. And 17% uh, and 66% of the sampled male and female respondents respectively had a child. So you can see um, the females, there is quite a disparity there. Then, on average, about 7%, uh, looking at the gadgets they owned, 7% had a TV, 46% owned a basic phone, 39% owned a smartphone, while less than 2% had a laptop. Um, for the cognitive skills, both males and female youth possessed digital literacy skills, but performed poorly when it came to literacy, uh, that is languages, and numeracy skills. So uh, this was based on the number of correct responses according to, to how we measured that in the questionnaire. When you look at the non-cognitive skills, both the males and female youth um, seemed to have poor scores in terms of their values, um, in terms of their personality traits, and uh, on these three big five, so we had a, uh, we had we grouped these specific values into the big five inventory. So where we have in for the opportunity to make this presentation, uh, my name is Bob Fritz, and we did this study with the Americans from Egerton University. Uh, myself, I work at the Zitek University, but currently the project is sponsored by ARC. Uh, which is supporting the human capital. Um, I have to appreciate the ARC because uh, they supported uh, 
attachment program in Addis Ababa for three months, where we also presented this paper that got some inputs. And it was interesting because uh, Policy Studies Institute in Ethiopia, they also carrying a similar study on the TVS graduates and transition to the labor market. So we appreciate the ARC. Uh, Oh, from him? Ah, I know somebody's controlling from him. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I thought I was still in some minutes as the presenter said, you know, from him. So, uh, I'm going to make a presentation on the role of technical and TV education. Relative to academic schooling in transition of the youth to labor market in Kenya. And some people will be wondering what's the difference between the technical and uh, the relative academic. We'll come to realize that as we progress the presentation. Uh, background of the study why is this study important? It's backed by the SDG number four, specifically uh, 4.31 and 4.4, which emphasizes on the quality technical and vocational education be important for employability of the youth. Number two, the Kenya Vision 2030. It aims to create a human resource based, based which is competitive globally through lifelong training and education. A huge aspect of the thing that comes in clearly. Number three, it's anchored in the Big Four agenda, which aims at creating 1.3 million jobs it's aimed at creating 1.3 million just by 2022 through the manufacturing pillar. And uh, through the manufacturing pillar, this way you find the TVS graduate playing a critical role because of their skills. And lastly, the Kenyan Constitution 2010, which emphasizes that every person has the right to education and every child has the right to free and compulsory education. So somebody was asking, is it option? It's not option. The constitution makes it mandatory for free education. So what are the issues of concern? Number one is the TV ecosystem and the employment. And if you compare Kenya with the rest of the East African countries, you realize that it has a high rate of unemployment compared to other countries. Some will argue and say it's because Kenya the literacy level is high, but you are saying it's not a crime to be educated. So that's why we need to look for a solution to these educated youths. Uh, some situations, in some situations, we saw former uh, technical institutes being converted into regular universities, which created a crisis of skills. That's why some point if you are looking for a plan, it was becoming a problem because everybody was running to the university. Different institutions were converted into universities, therefore creating that gap. Issue number two, the rural population, which is combined with unemployment. So we have a high number of uh, youths which are being released into the job market. But then the, the population is not matched by the job creation which is a serious problem. And number three, uh, the curriculum change. Currently, the country is experiencing a transition from the 844 to the CPC. And therefore, this study is relevant. It's at the right time because it's going to, to create that synergy as we transition from the CPC then to the TVET sector. So objectives, uh, the study had two objectives. One, to investigate the status of the TV sector in Kenya in respect to uh, employment. And objective number two, to examine the effect of TV education relative to academic scoring on transitional youth to labor markets in Kenya. Now, uh, my predecessor who presented um, showed how the TV numbers have been increasing. And myself now, I'm showing the type of the TV institution that we are in Kenya. We have the private uh, vocational training centers and the public. And then we have the private technical training centers and uh, private again. 
and then you have the youth politicians. So these are the main players. On the governance and management of the Tibet institutions, I'm sure uh, this is the structure. On the top, you have the Minister of Education. Uh, then you have the State Department for Vocational and Technical Training. Then under that, we have various players. And I'm sure these are the major uh, stakeholders who are presented in this workshop. On the rubbish uh, in Tibet institution, again, the results are consistent with what has been presented before. And you can see the enrollment in Tibet institutions has been increasing. But the question is, are you concerned with numbers or the kind of skills that these graduates are getting? Because you could be excited, yes. The numbers are increasing, but the question is, do these numbers have the relevant skills that are needed in the job market? Again, we need to appreciate that uh, employment has been increasing, uh, but again, this is the general employment. The question is, why did you also increase in employment for this period of years, but then the youth unemployment is still persisting? So we need to know why. And as you can see from that, the trend has been up on, apart from the 2020, it's declined and rose again in 2020. For the 2020, we can understand, because it's when we had the COVID-19, which uh, brought the economy to stagnant, some people lost jobs, and that's why there's that sharp decline, and then increasing again. The conventional framework, uh, the study looks at the two sides of the economy, that's on the supply side and the demand side of the economy, with the main value being the employment status, uh, which used to measure the employability. Where we, where we are looking at the Tibet graduate who is employed, but it's a Tibet graduate who is not employed. You'll see this one uh, as we define the variables. Data sources and methodology. So the study is the KIPS 2005-2006. And somebody will ask why not 2015 and 2016? The answer is the 2005-2006 uh, kids captured very key param parameters of the Tibet. Because they're able to segregate the government Tibet, private Tibet, and the um, village Tibet. So that's why we went for that. For the 2015 2016, it was missing that key parameter of the Tibet. Uh, so uh, the study also conducted a key informal interview for the qualitative study addressing objective one and uh, two Tibet institutions were selected from each region for all the eight former regions in the country and we are picking a Tibet and a vocation. Mm, the study applied um, each method where both qualitative and quantitative approach were used. Qualitative for the key informer, which we did, uh, we interviewed the, the various players in the Tibet sector and quantitative, where we did the LPM. And the study there is the LPM, that's the linear probability model, to estimate the effect of Tibet education transitions of the youth from skills to the labor market. So the description of the variables is why I see now you understand uh, the difference between um, the normal academic and the Tibet. We are the main variable, which is the employment status. And um, I would go to those details. One was with employment youth, ways of success, zero other is. We had uh, the aspect of teacher experience, which we categorized those that had no, the new teachers, and up to those that were highly experienced. So for the newly teachers, uh, they should uh, have the required pedagogical skills, and we offered problem induction training programs. Uh, then uh, the second recommendation, uh, because we looked at the private schools performing better than the private schools, we are recommending that uh, learners from private school, uh, I mean the, uh, the, the schools to also be um, resourced, uh, not just in terms of teachers, but also in terms of infrastructure. Yeah, so there should be adequate uh, learning resources to guarantee the learner performance. And uh, finally, our recommendation was having specific training for mathematics teacher as well as subjects that have numeracy 
is an important policy intervention. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, my love. And you have really kept the time. 15 minutes exactly. I was counting. Households with children and their, uh, um, their first 1,000 days of life. So mobilization of mothers to seek early antenatal care. So this is very important because you know during this duration is when um, we are able to pick up the, the tiny things. So I am efficiency that we, they are able to be given the supplements, um, which also translates to low blood level, early infection, um, urinary tract infections, which we need to prenatal um, delivery, preterm delivery. So this. Area or this duration of time really needs to be taken care of, and how we do that is encouraging the mothers to seek early antenatal care. Then, increased hospital deliveries um, very important because we know that in case of any complications, at least they can be sorted out in good time. Um, and this is a challenge that you face, especially in the rural areas where mothers are delivering at home or they're delivering in uh, the level two or three. Uh, levels which don't have the newborn units and they're not uh, assisted with people with proper training. So the complications uh, which they face uh, is usually severe and also the fact that they cannot be assisted in good time really puts the child and the mother at a very high risk. Then enhancing exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months of life. So this is very important because breast milk has um, important is very important in the immunity uh, of the child and also the general development of the child. So I know we have formula feeds which uh, we encourage for the mothers who are unable to get enough breast milk, but still the benefits of breast milk as compared to formula feeds cannot be compared. Then increasing knowledge on proper weaning off diet. So weaning off basically is the transition from breastfeeding to the feeds themselves. Now this period is very important because many children actually go into malnutrition during this duration of time. Either because of ignorance, the mother didn't know how to wean off their child off, um, or just uh, the issues with poverty. So they know what to do but they don't have the finances to buy whatever is needed. Then full immunization, which basically is um, in an effort to prevent the, um, the to prevent childhood illnesses. Therefore, prevent morbidity and mortality. So um, this is a statement of the problem um, that despite the government's efforts in improving the lives of pregnant women and born children through uh, various programs, we still have 61.8% of deliveries. Uh, being attended uh, by skilled providers. That means there's a 30, there's a 40, 39 percent uh, of pregnancies that are not attended to by um, skilled attendants. And also there's the high cost of maternity services within in our country. That means that the women will opt to, will opt to uh, deliver at home. They prefer to go into herbal medications because they cannot afford the healthcare system. Then lastly, um, our study basically is to assess the link between investment in the first 1,000 years, 1,000 days, sorry, of life, and the health outcomes in Kenya. Sorry for that error. So these are the objectives of our study, to establish the status of the main needs of children and households with children under the age of two years, that's the first 1,000 days. Then to estimate the effect of access to critical services, um, and lastly to draw recommendations from that. So the data that we used uh, was KIHBS 2015-2016, which was conducted across 47 counties. Now, um, I know the issue would be we are in 2023, but when we were doing this study, this was the data that we had access to. Um, we can always upgrade it according to whatever data is available right now. Then um, the data surveyed 24,000 households distributed across both urban and rural areas, and it was collected over, um, the collection period was divided into four periods. So the study narrowed down the sample of data related to children under the age of five years and their characteristics. Um, and if, from the total um, population, the sample size consisted of 12,630 observations. So these are the key findings. Um, so first, our outcomes were to childbirth and child mortality. 
So for the childbirth, uh, it noted that among the male children delivered, 17.55% of boys and 19.5% of girls did not survive. That means that they were basically stillborn children. Then child mortality, um, that is basically the children who died within the first two years of life, 8.8% of male children and 8% of female children born died within the first two years of life. So that is really a big gap that needs to be um, to be dealt with as early as possible. So a total of 91% uh, of children breastfed for a duration of six months, which was really commendable. And among them, 39.8% are weaned off from milk other than breast milk and 33% were introduced to porridge. So already you see that you don't have really clear guidelines on how do you win off. And if you've interacted um, with the first-time mothers uh, or for the people in this crowd who've been first-time mothers, attempts with that confusion, we are six months, what do we start with? Are we doing the right thing? So this is the issue that we are facing at this point. Then the place of delivery. So it was interesting to find out that 41% were born in hospitals. 19% in level uh, 3 and 4 hospitals, then 38% were born at home. So this is the population that you really need to take care of. Then in terms of who assisted in delivery, 49% uh, of the uh, cases were assisted by midwives, then 14% by doctors, 20% uh, by trained birth assistants, and those who delivered by themselves were 4.7%. Um, so you can see that we have 38% who are born at home and we have 4.7% who were not assisted at all in the delivery process. Then when it comes to income in the population that uh, we had, in the study population, 28% had no source of income, which is a really big value, and 71% are earning between 0 and 1,000, uh, and 100,000 shillings. So that's the distribution is in between all the values. Then uh, in terms of uh, the population that ha had health insurance, 84% of the individuals did not have access to health insurance coverage. So that means that um, the 84% were financing their health out of pocket. And we do know that there's a common saying that you are um, a health issue away from poverty. If you've ever gone to the hospital and paid cash, you know how expensive it is. Then when it comes to vaccination, 90% of the children in rural areas and 93% uh, in urban areas were vaccinated. So um, this was a very good value, but if you look at uh, KDHS 2022, we have 80% of the children who were vaccinated in our country nationwide. But then there are really big disparities um, in terms of the counties. So um, counties such as Vihiga, which has the highest, has 96% of the population vaccinated. Then we have Garissa, which only 23% has been vaccinated. And this basically means that um, most of the children in some counties such as Garissa are at a high risk of um, preventable diseases such as diarrhea, uh, TB, and all the others that they have not been vaccinated against. Then it was also noted that children in urban settlements have better access to uh, essential services such as health, water, and sanitation as compared to rural settlements. And this was important because we are looking at outcomes such as diarrhea, which um, has high prevalence in areas with low water and sanitation. So um, the current policies in place are as below. So we have the expanded program for immunization, the KEPI. So um, this one was rolled out initially in, I think, in 1976 globally by the UNICEF, WHO stroke UNICEF. And the main aim was to ensure that we prevent the preventable mortalities, morbidities and mortalities. Then in 1980, it was rolled out in Kenya, and that is where we have 80% of our population vaccinated. But we've seen the gap that in some counties, um, a good percentage of the children have not been vaccinated. And especially because uh, we had a term that we are calling schooling. Yeah, but uh, for children, uh, because we had, uh, we had people from education and also from the ministry, uh, we are able to agree uh, on the difference between the two. And this is where uh, you can see from this picture uh, that we have the schooling and we also have learning. 
The school, as you can see, uh, we have those students there uh, who are on the uh, on the uh, mask. And even you know, remember that time you also on mask because it was during the COVID period. And I remember going with Dr. Bogua, you remember Dr. Kakariuki there uh, from the ministry. I also remember, of course, uh, PK uh, was the one steering the whole process. And we had Dr. Zakalari who was actually telling us that we are defining uh, schooling. We should not be talking about schooling, but we should be talking about uh, learning. And of course, uh, when we look at that, uh, we are able to actually differentiate between the two, the learning and the schooling. Because you can be in a school, and you can also be uh, 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 at the there, so we are seeing those guys who are the students who are learning. Yeah, so from that perspective, uh, then uh, another issue that came up uh, that time was, so why are you looking at COVID? So what about if we have some kind of a, a treatment for COVID? So where is your study going to, your study is going to drop? Uh, but again, uh, we indicated that our interest actually was not on COVID, uh, but trying to assess if we have a shock in the educational system, how is it likely to affect a school attendance? So at this point then, uh, we took a proxy, we took COVID-19 uh, incidents as a shock, as a, as a proxy for shock, so that in that case then we are saying, uh, we want to see if there's a shock, uh, how is it likely to affect our educational attendance in Kenya, our educational attendance here in England. So then how do we uh, define learning uh, during the COVID period? Because I want to be very clear here, I want to be very clear in terms of how we define our, 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 our learning. So uh, you remember that during that period, uh, students, uh, there was there were the cru crucial schools. And what happened is uh, students started learning through the internet. They said, uh, uh, we also had some kind of tuition, uh, where you have a tissue, a prayer teacher, he comes, or you have radio, you have TV. So we consider those ones to be a learning, uh, a learning uh, kind of learning uh, 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 methodology at that period of time. So in that case, uh, what we did, because another question that came up, and I remember very well, uh, from Professor Kalai, I know he's, well, he's in the room, uh, he was asking, actually, uh, how are you going to measure uh, the effect of COVID on education attendance and yet you are already in COVID? Which I think was a very, uh, was a very valid question. But what we did is we identified a variable which is now getting into, uh, get, get, get uh, either learning through internet, uh, learning through all those kind of modes of learning. Uh, so if you are learning through mo those modes, then we say you are 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 doing the learning. But if you are not, then we say that there is no learning that is taking place. So in that case, then within the environment of COVID, we are able to we are able to say to see uh, what we affected. Those who are able to use uh, the new or the current or that particular mode of learning. Uh, uh, from those who did, and in that case, then uh, we are we, we, we in that uh, we are then we come up with some kind of policy dimension, uh, which would then say if you have a period of shock like COVID or anything that is uh, uh, likely to affect the whole community, uh, this is the likely uh, likely uh, likely uh, kind of uh, policy that we want to adopt. So in that case, then. Uh, we, we asked also what the issue then. So the issue here was uh, we are looking at the shock, and the shock can be looked into uh, two ways. Uh, you can say that you have a shock uh, that affects a single household, uh, an individual household, or we can have a shock uh, that uh, can affect all the households. So in this case, uh, we had COVID, which was a shock, which was affecting all the all the households, uh, which meant that uh, in that case it was possible for us. Uh, to see uh, those who are able to use the, the, the kind of, of learning and uh, those who are not able to use uh, so that uh, during a, a period of shock, so how can we uh, remove uh, that, kind, that kind of inequality? <coughs> yeah, so having said that, then uh, uh, we looked at, we, we, we exit to the COVID and the laws, so this, I don't need to go to the history of COVID and uh, how many are affected. Of course, there is a paper that has come today 
uh, that was very noticeable. And then another important uh, finding uh, in this study uh, was that those kids who are staying with old people, you know, you increase the age of the household, uh, were likely or more likely not to attend any form of or any form of or any form of learning. Uh, so which then means that uh, it was very consistent uh, with, the, uh, with, the, with, the, with the assumption that uh, when you are old, you are able to cash to cash a uh, coin. Yeah? yeah, so which meant that uh, uh, there was a reduction, so likelihood that uh, students were not going to, of course, you can really, then once you get the results, maybe now you start to think what would have been the cause of that. Then another important thing that we also found, which I think I've not put here, uh, is the type of uh, uh, the, 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 the type of the, the class. We found that if a student was in an examination class, for example, uh, you are in uh, you are you are you are happy, that is you are able to do an exam, uh, the chances of you uh, attending a schooling or what we are calling learning there was very high. And this was important in terms of our in terms of our 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 assessment of our Kenyan education because it means that our Kenyan education is exam oriented because if it's copied then you find that others are not bothered about a lot of learning but those who are exam class all of them are and it was a very very significant number so I think that was key to mention then something else that also came out and very clearly and which was also very consistent with what we are reading in the papers uh, was that uh, if you are if you are a girl or a female for that matter, you are you are more likely not to attend to any school. So which meant that again you can see some differential there, uh, where girls were disadvantaged uh, during the during this uh, this COVID period. Yeah. So yeah, another one is another which actually uh, was key in this in our in our studies, and which I have also. Uh, hey, many of us are uh, coming up with in terms of uh, public school and private school. So it was true that uh, uh, if you are in public school, the probability of you schooling, maybe the kid for, for a lot of course, uh, the probability of the learners uh, attending school then or learning uh, were much lower uh, than if you are from a private a private school, but again, this was a very surprising result uh, to us because uh, during that time, uh, many of us, or even in the papers, uh, we could hear that uh, many private schools have closed uh, because of COVID. But uh, this was contrary; our results actually came contrary to uh, what uh, we thought we knew. Yeah, so we had an issue there: urban public schools and uh, rural public schools. Uh, so we found that uh, the rural public uh, schools were less likely uh, to attend learning, to attend schooling, what we are calling the learning, uh, than the, 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 the public, public school which were in, uh, in, 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 uh, in private, I mean in, in urban areas. So meaning that there was differential between the public schools, uh, those located in urban areas, uh, being better positioned to transition, uh, the virtual learning, for example. Yeah, so uh, from this, uh, uh, because uh, it was more or less like a hypothesis testing, of course we came up with some few uh, recommendations, uh, which uh, say that, okay, uh, in the future, during a, a, a shock uh, that is likely to affect the education system, uh, we, we need to think seriously uh, in terms of orientation, in terms of public orientation, how do we have the public uh, public school uh, to? We need to do some kind of uh, uh, some kind of not, not really kind of uh, supporting the public school and the uh, leading the private uh, school, but we need to see where is it that the public school are disadvantaged, uh, so that uh, we can uh, control the, the we can mitigate uh, the, the shock at that particular time. So of course the, this came out, uh, the issue of uh, ICT and all that, uh, we are saying that uh, this kind of uh, system needs to be uh, uh, well, uh, well prepared in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, ICT, uh, especially uh, when you have a shock uh, that is likely to affect uh, the, the, the whole of education system. 
So these are uh, like common garden variety kind of policy which what is discussed today and uh, the, we also know that uh, they are crucial and important because to some extent uh, they were able to mitigate some of the what could have been even a worse uh, situation in terms of uh, outcome of education. Yeah, so they are also saying uh, when we talk of the rural areas, uh, then the policy here is uh, can we come up with some kind of targeted uh, transfers, yeah, uh, in terms of uh, not just not just copy, but also in other shop, uh, we should think about uh, uh, some resources uh, that should go uh, to rural areas. Uh, given that uh, this being a shop, it is giving a signal that rural areas are heavily disadvantaged uh, in terms of many things. So targeting uh, is a uh, something that uh, would really uh, be useful. Uh, the old people uh, hypothesis here uh, is really tied to the uh, to the to the to the to the, to the COVID because we don't know how the any other shock will come up. But we don't because by then we are still working within a COVID environment. We know that was a very good policy then. Uh, 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 maybe give uh, vaccine to old people so that uh, we can also that indirect is going to affect. Uh, uh, uh to some extent. Yeah, so key messages. Uh, the key messages uh, that came from this uh, from this uh, study uh, was that uh, school attendance uh, is confirmed to be critical to human capital development, uh, but presence of shock like COVID pandemic uh, disrupt the normal school attendance. And then we also see that uh, uh, given the disparity in access to learning techno technology between private and public schools across Kenya and between the poor and the, the rich, uh, then a very serious a signal of inequality was observed uh, during uh, this uh, period of uh, COVID. And then we are saying uh, then uh, we have a problem uh, in future in uh, achieving our SDG 10 uh, that talks about uh, uh, or in quality of the solutions. So again, uh, what came up as another message is that the government should provide better and targeted uh, physical, uh, uh, physical incentives. We can modify so that at least there's uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Ngoro called earlier public participation, so that they are not just coming from researchers themselves, but um, uh, from all of us. One thing that is very clear is that the papers presented today, the seven of them are quite rich. They have really touched on many facets of uh, human capital development and for which we can tease out critical uh, uh, comments or critical issues that uh, we can take home. One is that there's no doubt human capital development is critical for development. I think in all the papers we have seen this since morning, that for us to develop as a country, we cannot ignore human capital. The challenge is that uh, the data that is available and information that is there tend to focus so much on uh, what we can measure, personal performance, right? Learning outcome that are measurable but we forget of what uh, uh, Carol called co non-cognitive features. So as we think forward about uh, human capital development, we need to internalize and see how can we measure what has not been measured in a long time in far as human capital development is concerned. We have focused a lot again here on education, we, also, we have also to add the entire on health, which are all important. And uh, in human capital development, we say health is, um, is education, skill development, and training. So those need to look. And we are saying there are no, we don't want to assume that there are no policies. But perhaps the policies that are in place require to be modified, to be improved in order to serve the purpose for which they are meant to. So if it is in primary education, if it is in Tibet, uh, if it's in higher education, all these are critical elements that need to be looked into so that before we can say, change this policy, we already have what it is. 
we cannot talk of um, human capital development unless the capital we are developing is also getting its way into the market. Again, understanding the human skill and employability in order to see, do we just train uh, for the market, for white collar, for employment, for, for, uh, for, for self-employment? What kind of education system do we have? What has emerged is that we need to have a match between the supply and the demand side of the labor market. Uh, I remember uh, uh, Pro, uh, Professor Olunga saying that um, it's not just technical know-how, uh, people are talking today of technical know-how. So again, we may focus too much on what we are producing without looking what is it the market is needing. So looking at the two sides of this divide is very critical. Human capital development is quite varied and uh, since morning and the discussions that have been coming up is that um, these policies may not apply wholesomely because we have regional uh, and gender variations on most of the uh, items that we are looking at today and therefore we cannot ignore the, the variation so that even if you have a policy we might need some um, affirmative action to ensure that uh, the policies are meeting the targeted uh, 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 beneficiaries. Thirdly, I think our education system has for a long time focused on training skills development for employment and for white collar job. And the trend in the education sector has shown for a long time that uh, we were neglecting the mid-level training, the skills development, and particularly in the areas of Tibet. This shows that we need to refocus and see what roles do Tibet play in our uh, development agenda. <coughs> uh, we saw a wave where all mid-level colleges were being converted into universities, and um, then all of a sudden we are saying we need to revitalize our our, our Tibet, and a lot of issues on Tibet have been presented here today. One is that Tibet is critical. We need to train on skills, we need to train on cognitive, and also non-cognitive. We need to look at issues of financing and curriculum in Tibet education. So these are elements of Tibet education that we need to look at so that we can channel a uh, labor force that can helping the, uh, can get employed or can get engaged in the labor market in whichever way, either through self-employment or through uh, wage employment. When we think of education, financing is very important and uh, studies presented here have also shown that financing can come from the public sector, can come from the household, from the donors, and all of them have played different roles at different times in terms of um, advancing agenda for access to education. But perhaps the outcomes that are expected or that would have been expected are not realized, partly because the resources that are provided may not be reaching the intentions for which. And from this meeting, we saw that um, Again, looking at the statistics, we can see that it's not just financing, but what elements of education are we financing? What kind of expenditures are there? If the whole budget is still going to uh, recurrent expenditures, it may not reach to the expected outcome. The issue of mismanagement uh, also came out very strongly that uh, we may have resources unless we have systems and procedures for ensuring that uh, they reach the they reach the intended beneficiary we may end up uh, missing out <coughs> on how the intention that uh, the, uh, the next point is that um, investment in health 
um, in quality of the teachers has also come up very strongly. That uh, it's not just a matter of posting teachers to school. We need, or this need to pay attention to the nature of uh, teachers of quality. I know it's been a contentious issue here. How do we measure the quality? But there are indicators. I think uh, a presentation by Mela was showing that you need more teachers. You need teachers with P1, P2, especially in the formative stage. I don't know whether that would be right to say that we need to employ more female teachers in the primary school because they appear to improve on the learning compared to male. And uh, that, that I found uh, very interesting. But we need to look at what help learners learn in terms of teacher quality and qualification. So that is an area. And I picked, we picked up the issue of continuous training uh, especially for P1 and P2s and in-service training to ensure that uh, pedagogy is well understood. What we do to the new teachers is to ensure that they have the, the right skills. In terms of the health sector, we've seen that um, um, if we were talking of human capital development, this need for more investment, perhaps more uh, targeted investment in pre- and postnatal uh, healthcare in this country so that we can reduce some of the uh, uh, mortality rate, especially for children under five. The paper on investments in 100,000 days has shown this very clearly that there are gaps. Finally, uh, I think the, the, la uh, the last but not the least is what we have picked from the COVID paper that um, it is true COVID came. We hope it is gone and gone for, for good so that we can relax. But shocks are about to happen anytime. No one knows when a pandemic may hit. But how are we prepared in terms of our system? And colleagues here have mentioned how perhaps we appeared disoriented from ourselves as uh, decision makers from government when COVID hit because of course, we all say there, was, there has never been such a shock in our times, but what mechanism do we see? And even where the resources were availed, we saw a lot of misuse, right? That such that, again, the intended benefits may not have been uh, realized. So in a nutshell, these are the nine points. Of course, we will do a more detailed report that I, we picked as recommendation and uh, we want just in case we missed out on something uh, that uh, was is critical that you think we can take as the outcome of this workshop we can strengthen we can amend we can um, change the nine points that are presented where it's not clear please we can also be firm. so perhaps we'll allow uh, with your permission dr leche uh, two or three comments, just seeing whether what we have captured is sufficient or is still require a whole writing of the papers, but generally I have not had anyone saying that what was presented is trash, so meaning the researchers did some good work. So thank you very much. Uh, let's hear. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh,